Well, look, we've, we've got an $8.6 billion capital program that we announced for schools. Um, that, that is absolutely essential. Uh, municipalities, as they attract young families, need a place for those kids to be able to go to school, go on a playground and participate in after school activities. So that is um, that is our obligation to make sure that we do that. That is um, one of our, our great priorities. We've also developed a new funding formula with the municipalities so that as our revenues go up, their revenues go up by a percentage uh, as well. I think they're, we're anticipating it to go up 14% year over year. And as we continue to attract people, they'll benefit from it that way. That was the model that they asked us for. The, um, we have, I have proposed uh, changing some of the one-off grant programs to um, roll it into the LGFF. And I, I, I frankly don't have consensus among the municipalities. And I think part of the reason for that is that uh, when you need a major uh, road repair or a municipal uh, water or wastewater investment, or even an LRT, it requires a substantial amount of one-time funding. So we're trying to find the right balance of being able to give those dedicated grants to accelerate the big programs, but then also give them more of their own unencumbered funds so that they can make their own priorities on what to do. I mean, do we have the balance right? We'll continue the conversation on that. I must tell you, I think they've got a very good point about um, us paying the full property tax rate on the buildings that we have in their communities. I'm still investigating a little bit about why that decision was made. I've raised it as a topic of conversation with my minister and my finance minister. And so we're going through the process now of seeing if, if that's something that we would be able to address. The second follow-up question is about collaboration. You did mention it in your speech about working closely with other municipalities yeah. and municipalities in general. How do municipalities ensure that these are not just soft words, that there's going to be action put behind the words that we're talking about in meeting with the Alberta municipalities or even mayors in Reeves. Well, you know, I, I, I see uh, the, the heads of the associations many times. I, I, I also, whenever I go to municipalities for the tours that I do, my MLAs almost always have me set up to meet with their local councils. I do regular meetings with my councils in the area that I represent. So we have lots of opportunity to be able to get feedback. As I said, like, we're not always going to agree on everything, but their perspective is is vitally important. And, and when, I mean, when it, it really matters, we work incredibly well together. Like, look at Jasper, for instance. Ja Jasper, um, uh, because they're a unique municipality in a national park, um, we, they, they, they directly report up through Parks Canada. But we've been a huge advocate for them in being able to get local control over their permitting and their development. We're the ones putting up $149 million to help them with the transition as they're starting the rebuild. We're the ones working with them on identifying what the solutions are. And it's just because that's what we have to do. We have to work together in partnership. So I hope people see that that, um, that, that that's the, the approach that we want to take. Let's identify the issues. Let's work together to solve them. Well, I can tell you, um, uh, this is an area that you're going to see increasingly my seniors community and social services minister have more to say on. Uh, we're right in the process right now of analyzing what type of supportive living falls within the purview of healthcare and what should be transferred over to seniors community and social services. And, and part of the reason for that is that we, in seniors community and social services, we do have incredible partnerships with community, with nonprofits, with charities, with municipalities and with private sector to help to um, to, to build facilities effectively. So that's part of the reason why we're able to have a $9 billion spend to add 25,000 affordable housing units over the next uh, number of years. And we probably need to have a similar type of program to build out supportive living for those who have special needs, to build out supportive living for those who are aging, to have supportive living for those who have addiction and mental health issues. That's that's one of the things that we're reviewing right now. We will have more to say about it in uh, in the coming months, but we would absolutely rely on our partners in uh, municipalities and the private sector to help us with that build. Like to give you an idea, we've got 1,500 people in acute care beds in hospital 
who should be in an alternative level of care because of homelessness, addiction, mental health, or aging. We also have 1,800 waiting in community for an appropriate space. So we know that there's a 3,300 bed demand just to meet the existing need. And so we're going to have to, to look at a, a model for how we can meet that demand. We, we're just in the process right now of identifying the nature of the problem and the scope of it. And the solutions will, will be coming very likely through the budget process in February. Mm. You, you know, I, I think that the, the promise of vote counting machines was that we would end up with uh, faster election results and uh, people would feel uh, confidence in the result. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, I think when I've observed what has happened with, um, for instance, the last provincial election, we didn't get results until you guys tell me one or two o'clock in the morning. And often it was because it was the tabulators that came in last. And um, I think that uh, we what, what what we have heard is that people want to go back to counting ballots the old-fashioned way by paper, and so that's what we're going to do at the provincial level, and we've started doing that at the municipal level. Uh, Michelle Del Monte, you may want to follow up on that question. Yeah. Uh, a new report from the city of Edmonton says that not using tabulators add two point six million dollars in additional cost. The city of Red Deer says it'll be three and a half times the cost of the last election. And here in the city of Red Deer, they said that there's never been any problem. Or sorry, city of Edmonton, I should say, and they've been using it for, for more than two decades. So, is the pro what is the province going to do about these additional costs? For this? Well, look, we have asked the municipalities to give us the um, the statement of their costs, and so that we can help defray them. But look, it's it's uh, it's one time we get together every four years at the municipal level, every four years at the provincial level. Um, it's a, an important democratic right and an important democratic responsibility that we make sure that we've got the uh, resources there. So we'll work with those municipalities. I think there's um, about 30 municipalities that uh, use tabulators of the 320. So we'll work with those 30 municipalities to see what we can do to defray the cost. But we're not prepared to ask them to do something that we're not doing ourselves. We'll, we'll be um, debating doing the same thing at the provincial level when uh, the Elections Act changes come through next spring. Not using tabulators is going to mean that we have to get so much more staff in, and it will take days to count ballots. And I, I'm just wondering, like, and they're also concerned, it's hard enough to find election workers now. What are they going to do in, for the next election that they actually have to hand count all these ballots? Well, I, I guess we'll, uh, we'll we'll work with them to see. I mean, we're going to go through the same challenge when we have a provincial election. And so having a, a workforce of individuals who do that at the municipal level allows for us to be able to have that same workforce when we ha when we count votes at the provincial level. But I, I think the problem is that uh, um, the the results of having, having some of the problems that we observed in the provincial election. Which problems? I, I don't remember there being any problems. Oh. Can you be specific? Yeah, Miranda Rosen was giving her acceptance speech at 12.30 at night, and then the last ballot came in, which was a tabulator ballot, and it changed the result at 1 o'clock in the morning. That's what happens during elections. Even if the, even if the, even if the ballots are being handed... Let me tell you two more. Happens. Let me tell you two more. We ended up, I was told, that uh, on uh, whenever you wanted to do a recount, you'd be able to see the paper ballots. And so we had two recounts that we had to do, at great cost to our party, by the way. thirty to $40,000, I believe, is what we ended up spending. And it turned out not to be true. We didn't actually get to see the paper ballots from all of the tabulators. So those are a couple of the reasons. I mean, if you want to be able to ensure that you have a proper recount, you have to be able to see paper ballots. And they weren't able to deliver on that promise. So we're going to go back to doing things the old-fashioned way, and we'll see how it works. Hi, Sean with City News. Uh, yesterday you said that uh, Alberta has two provincial police forces. Yep. Are you referring to RCMP and Sheriff? I was. How does that make sense? Does that not add more cost, red tape, bureaucracy to managing two concurrent provincial police forces? Well, we've got um, the city of Edmonton and city of Calgary, each have their police force, as does Tabor, and so does Lacombe, and so does Medicine Hat, and Grand Prairie will soon. I, I think that uh, that demonstrates that having different options for different communities makes sense. Um, the reason we're doing it is because the RCMP has not been able to fill the need that we have. We pay for 1,911 officers, and they have four or 500 vacancies and we cannot allow for municipal or for rural communities to be under policed and so we have um, uh, trained up our sheriffs to a point where they have the same training as police so that they can do more work in um, in being able to operate across the different police forces as I mentioned in my in my talk um, 
They already do surveillance have for some time. They, um, they, our scan team shuts down drug houses, and we're regularly seeing um, results from that. Our uh, fugitive apprehension team has been extraordinarily successful. 3,000 executed warrants and 350 really bad dudes being captured and kept um, in uh, incarcerated. And so we've been, we've rolled out a similar team of seven in Calgary to be able to help down there. Um, our highway patrol. I mean, as uh, if you talk to any highway patrol officer, they say that one thing is consistent, that bad guys need a getaway and they're using our roads. And so that's one of the ways in which you have to, in which we apprehend criminals. So I would say I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the work of our, of our sheriffs. And when Mike Ellis came in, he was actually surprised that uh, there was so little additional training that we needed to be able to get them up to the same standard as police. So we just want to give more options. And I think that's better. Many surveys have indicated that Albertans do not want this. The <clears throat> municipalities has voted against the, the policing model. RMA has said we don't want this. So why is the government forcing this on people who have made it pretty clear, even in the Fair Deal panel, Albertans don't want this? Well, you know, ask Calgary and Edmonton if they would like the RCMP to be their police service rather than the Calgary Police Service and the Edmonton Police Service, because I think you'd get a different answer. I think the people we have to ask are the people who are being policed by the RCMP. And the people who are being policed, that was the, point of your panel. the people who are being policed by the RCMP are demonstrating to us through the decisions that they're making that they're very interested in looking at an option that will make sense for them. Grand Prairie is moving away from the, the RCMP to their own municipal police force. As I said, there's about 15 to 20 additional uh, 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 requests for research dollars to to for different communities to figure figure out different options, and so we'll work with whichever community wants to work with us on on uh, moving to a different option. But we we think it's our responsibility to provide the options. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it's more than you, um, in your remarks to Well, look, I mean, we, we want to make sure that the, the federal government isn't trying to do a workaround on our policies by going directly to municipalities. And so I've been watching in other jurisdictions where I have seen that the, the federal government um, or the municipalities have gone directly to the federal government to try to uh, get policies in place that go contrary to what the provincial government wants. And I'll give you two examples. I see in uh, Toronto, they wanted Toronto to be a decriminalization zone for all drugs against the wishes of Premier Doug Ford. If any municipality wanted to do that here, I would say no because that's not our policy. Our policy is to have a balanced approach that includes uh, leading with recovery. We're just not, we don't believe there's such a thing as a safe supply of fentanyl or, and we don't want vending machines of, with crack pipes like we're seeing in other jurisdictions. So those are the kind of things we would say no to. Um, I'm also observing in municipalities in British Columbia and Quebec that they are voting not to allow any hookups of natural gas to new construction. Well, people will die in Alberta if we don't have natural gas electricity and we don't have natural gas heating. Heat pumps just simply don't work in a certain environments. And so um, what, that, that's an ideological decision that I'm watching certain municipal councils make. And we are not going to put the safety of our citizenry at risk because of those kinds of ideological decisions. So those would be the things that I've seen happen in other jurisdictions. And we're just getting ahead of it. We just don't want to see those things happen here. So that would be the reason why we're taking the approach we are. Yeah. Well, look, we wanted to at least let people know that there are other rates available and we wanted to provide some stability to the rate of last resort because you will recall that it spiked to 32 cents a kilowatt hour last year. And we, uh, we, we just know that that impairs uh, the ability for low-income individuals to manage their household budget. It impairs our small business community. It also impairs uh, large, heavy electricity users when, when rates go that high. So we've now, I think, put in enough measures that we will st see stability so that even those who do not go onto a contract are not going to see those extraordinary uh, price hikes. I think our 
uh, our rate got, went down. I think they, it was trading as low as two cents a kilowatt hour to, sh to give you some idea of the impact that happens when you bring on new base load power. And we want to be able to make sure that electricity maintains one of our competitive advantages. So we'll watch and see what the rate of last resort looks like. We'll watch and see who might be impacted by that we, and then perhaps have a more targeted approach to help the, the most vulnerable. Well, look, I mean, we, we all know that we have a lane that we've got to stay in. Um, we have a constitution that defines the relationship between the federal and the provincial government. And I do my best not to... Uh, um, you know, with legislate in areas of currency and uh, passports and managing airports and defense. That's my job is to not try to trample on federal jurisdiction. And it's the federal government's job not to trample on our jurisdiction. And similarly, it's the municipal government's job, I believe, to operate within the mandate that we've given them, which is essentially to be focusing on local property related services. And so if they stray into areas that might impact people's rights, if they stray into areas that um, might uh, be working contrary to our, our, our policy that is outside their mandate, we're go going to step in. That's all it is. I mean, we already had to in a couple of areas um, when the uh, City of Calgary refused to accept our strong hints that we wanted them to change the local access fee. We passed legislation saying that they had to, and now we're going to see changes coming in in January. When the city of Edmonton wanted to continue on with um, health mandates, we said, no, you can't do that. Uh, health policy is provincial jurisdiction. So those are a couple of examples of where we've had to step in. I hope we don't have to very often, but uh, there there are certain circumstances where if we, if we see that there's legislation that uh, goes outside municipal boundaries, then we're, we're going to, to be prepared to act on that. And my follow-up is unrelated to our colleagues. Mm -hmm. When we hear speed, there's been multiple fatal crashes in recent years yeah. in Edmonton, in which the Achilles Bay speed is a factor. Edmonton Police Chief has said that changing the traffic safety act to eventually give officers the authority to speed in high vehicles to like 50 kilometers or over the speed limit could mean causing hmm. this. It, it hasn't come forward um, as a, a, a cabinet discussion or a caucus discussion. So I, I'd invite you to maybe talk to Mike Ellis to see if he's contemplating that. Normally the process is that my minister will do consultation and if he thinks something has enough support, he'll uh, bring it to, to cabinet for discussion and we'll go through the process. It hasn't it hasn't been an active conversation yet though. Hi. Last question, sorry. Okay, thanks for having me. Lisa Johnson with the Canadian Press. Um, the vote counting machines is actually a perfect example because today we mm -hmm. saw Members of Alberta municipalities vote 85 percent. They don't want you to take away their vote counting machines because it's going to cost them money. It's going to cost them in human resources. 85 percent. So this is one of the latest examples. Some would argue. Uh, some of your critics would argue um, that you are governing right now in the interests of a very narrow set of people in your party. <laughs> How would you react to that criticism? Uh, that, that right now you're governing for about 5,000 people are going to show up to the AGM and not all Albertans. Look, we're, we're, we're not always going to agree with the municipalities. They also debated a motion to allow permanent residents the ability to vote, even though our constitution says you have to be a citizen. So those are the kind of things where um, the, you have to make sure that municipalities are going to honor the laws of our land. And um, one of the things I would say about uh, municipal government is that they operate within the parameters that we set under the Municipal Government Act. They, they are a creature of the, of the provincial government. And as a provincial government, we have heard that uh, people want to go back to paper ballots. So we've started with municipalities and we're going to be doing, the, doing that at the provincial level too. Um, I wonder if you can be a little bit more specific about who you're hearing that from. But I have another um, last couple of questions for colleagues. Uh, Ghost Dam location mm. was recently announced. Um, Six Sigma isn't pleased about this um, mm. announcement. Uh, can you tell me why was the ban shut out of preliminary studies and not offered um, any consultation on the location of that? I'm not quite sure why Six Sigma has um, has the concern. So I, I'd have to talk with them a little bit more. We do know that. Um, uh, there was a potential alternative site at Stony Dakota 
Um, but uh, they did not let us on their property to do the assessment. And so we ruled that that out. So I, I don't quite, I, I, I'm sort of grasping to understand why uh, Siksika might be upset. Great. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Do you have any more questions? Please send me an email back to you. <laughs>